Okay, Jacqueline Von Den Ende. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had to perfect practice that a few times to make sure I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming. Uh, this is an early episode of our new Capital Series. Uh, and the purpose of the series, of course, is to uh, shine a light on what's happening up and down the climate capital stack and learn from people in the trenches that are doing the important work and hope, hopefully, in addition to educating the ecosystem on uh, what's happening in the climate tech capital stack, just enable more intelligent matchmaking for everybody, which is kind of our own little way to um, to speed up impact with the content that we do. Makes sense. Yeah, and and you're right in the trenches doing the work. So yep. <laughs> uh, super excited to learn more about uh, carbon equity uh, and uh, and also your journey to start carbon equity in the first place. Sure. So maybe that's a good place to start. What's carbon equity? What the hell is carbon equity? Carbon equity is a climate venture capital and private equity fund investing platform. And we make it possible for retail investors to invest in breakthrough climate solutions alongside top professional investors by enabling low minimum access to the world's best climate venture capital and private equity funds. And how did this all come about? What's the origin story for the firm? The origin story, who? Okay, I spent half my life as an investor, respectively as a private equity investor and later as a partner in a VC fund and other half building companies. In 2019, I really woke up to the climate crisis. Like I had always been aware of the climate problem, but it really came to the fore in 2019 when I read the book, The Sixth Extinction. Have you read that? I have not. Okay, Elizabeth Colbert's Sixth Extinction, highly recommend it. And that for me was a little bit of the, the mic drop moment of like realizing, holy shit, if we don't solve climate change, nothing else matters. So at that point, I decided I wanted to spend the next 30 years of my life helping fight climate change. And my weapon of choice is capital because I strongly believe that ultimately money decides what happens in the world. So... I'm on a 30 year journey for myself to see how I can truly move the needle on climate change through capital and carbon equity is uh, version 1.0 of that, trying to shift uh, the trillions of capital moving into ESG stocks, which are not moving the needle into private markets, venture capital, growth equity and buyout where you can have a much more has serious impact in helping climate solutions scale up or innovate and scale up to maturity. And so when you first had this, as you called it, mic drop moment, how did you go from that to landing on this, this one idea and strategy and, and approach? Were there different twists and turns? Did you look at a number of different things or, or did you jump right to this one? The original idea... Uh, I was living in the Philippines. I was an entrepreneur, so I'm Dutch, uh, but I lived in the Philippines for six years. I built uh, several companies there. And at the time, around 2018, 2019, I quite regularly flew between Amsterdam and Manila. And at some point after reading this book by Elizabeth Colbert, I thought like, okay, my, my, my carbon footprint from flying is huge. So I calculated what my carbon footprint was. It was I think three tons of carbon or something, and it cost me 28 euros to offset that. And so I wondered, where is that money going? And apparently it went to solar panels in India. Uh, and the question and sort of a naive question at that point popped up in my mind. And I was thinking like, why is this a donation? Why don't I get a piece of solar panel in return? And the idea that popped into my head, the vision that popped into my head at that point was what if instead of offsetting in the form of, for example, planting trees, which is not a structural solution to climate change, we could invest with millions of people in technological solutions that can be a structural solution to climate change and in the process, create millions of micro shareholders of the net zero economy. So that was the original idea at point of sale, micro investments in climate technology solutions to fuel money into breakthrough climate solutions and create massive a joint ownership of the net zero economy. 
So, so wait, so if we can stop right there. So when you're in line at, let's say, the supermarket, the same way they put like little mini chocolates and uh, tabloid magazines and things like that, it would be the equivalent of like a micro purchase that would actually make you an owner that you could just tack on where you buy other stuff. Was that that was the initial idea? Exactly. It's sort of like paying 1% of whatever you're paying and investing that into climate solutions. And the idea there would be, you know, if you compare that to offsetting, offsetting is typically buying off your guilt and it's a one-time transaction. And when you're protecting trees, for example, I mean, it's a good solution, better than nothing, but it's not a structural solution to climate change. So the thought was by investing, you build you fund structural solutions to climate change, but you also create people and people will be invested in to invest is to be invested in for the next 10, 20 years of the lifetime of the companies that you're funding. So the idea was also to also build this positive sentiment around climate change. Typically, when we talk about climate change, we talk about the problem and rightfully so. But it's also a pretty exciting opportunity to create companies that are way more sustainable. And so when people actually, you know, have actual ownership in that transition, it can also create sort of long-term engagement, excitement about building this net zero future. And that's what we're trying to do with carbon equity. So it isn't necessarily just attracting more capital. It is, uh, making the broader populace or some meaningful subset of it an owner, which then opens their eyes to, uh, it's, it's also, I mean, it's a weird example, but like, I'm not much of a, uh, college, um, basketball fan, but, uh, oh, I think it's really cool. I just don't, I don't follow that closely, but if I did the, the March Madness pool, right? Like I'm going to tune in because I want to win. Right. Yeah. So it may, maybe it's a little like, like that. Yes. It, or stock options in a company, right? It's like, you know, like, like give, give people ownership so they act like an owner. This is exactly it. Exactly. And you, you really create excitement because you have that ownership. And that's exactly the type of momentum we want to build. So two goals. One, unleash capital at scale to fund breakthrough climate solutions. On the other hand, build more equitable ownership and this feeling of ownership. And the best case effect is sort of the Tesla effect where people who own an electric car also get solar panels on their house, for example, because it becomes part of their, yeah, their identity. Now, are we talking about where you, like the initial entry point where this became alive or are we talking about where you are today in terms of the vision? This was an initial entry point. So we started talking with the likes of, you know, the Royal Dutch Airlines, KLM, for example. We spoke to sort of the Amazon equivalents. And we realized that point of sale integrations were really difficult at that point. Um, and what we're doing, retail ownership of equity is a highly regulated space. So super difficult. Um, so we decided at that point that our starting point would be to go from top to bottom instead of from bottom to top. So our observation then was if we want to be investing in private markets, there's a huge amount of capital sitting in the world that has no access to private markets. So we focus currently uh, on what we call the mass affluent market. So not yet on the retail, retail market mass affluent. And we define that as people with a net worth between 100,000 euros and 10 million. Globally, in that strata of wealth, there's approximately 177 trillion in net worth, which is three times the size of the institutional asset management market. And on average, that market has less than 1% exposure to private markets. And the reason why is because it's super difficult to invest in top funds. Typically, top funds have uh, very high capital minimum investment requirements. Typically, you need two to five million euros to even get a seat at the table in a fund. You need network with the fund partners to get into the top funds. And third, you need quite a lot of expertise to select the right fund managers. So for all those reasons, people have virtually no allocation to private markets, whereas it makes total sense for anybody who has in excess of 100K on their bank account to diversify and put 10, 20% of their liquid net worth into long-term diversified private equity. 
So our starting point in this whole mission is open up access, low minimum access to top climate venture capital and private equity funds for mass affluent investors, and then gradually go down towards smaller and smaller uh, retail investors. And maybe ultimately we'll end up with the original vision of being able to invest a dollar uh, in uh, climate tech solutions when you buy your flight, for example. Uh, but this is a more practical starting point. Uh huh. And it it's and it strikes me that that building what you just described, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem uh, because if you want to get the attention of the top firms, you need the capital. But in order to get the capital, you need to have the access to the top firms. Uh, so. How does one start uh, with that kind of t- two-sided marketplace? And how did you start when, when, you, when you first started trying to make progress towards the vision that you just articulated? Super good question, uh, because you definitely have a chicken and an egg problem when starting out, having zero capital and wanting to get into the very best funds. So what we did is, I mean, we're a European firm. We started off raising some venture funding ourselves primarily from a big group of angels that were super well connected. So we have some founding partners of the likes of Carlisle. We have a lot of people from the impact space in Europe. We have some famous founders from Germany who are angel investors. And they really helped us open doors initially, getting us in contact with partners at top firms. So one of the first funds that we invested in was 2150 VC. They are an urban tech sustainability fund. We're big fans of what they do. They were in the process of raising their uh, first fund. And we got the opportunity via uh, these warm introductions to be part of their initial fundraise. And so we start off with a really small amount. We raised three and a half million or something, but we got a seat at that table and, and that's how we started. And from there on, started doing more funds. We launched a fund of funds type vehicle and yeah, things started rolling. And so tell me about that process of raising that first three and a half million. Uh, how did you do it? Who did you target? And uh, what did you learn? Yeah, <laughs> this is really testing the waters at that point. I think we started off really simple and practical. We started off, okay, we got the allocation. Let's see if we can fill it. Uh, So obviously we put it on our platform, but our platform had pretty limited traffic at that point. So we really leveraged our network. So we leveraged the network of our personal network. We leveraged the network of all of our angel investors. We used LinkedIn to get the word out and... I think it sold out in less than three weeks. It was really crazy because there were so many people who had actually been waiting for this moment. Like, okay, I want to be participating in climate tech. I want to do that not through angel investments, but through a funds type of setup. And this was the only way people could participate with relatively low amounts. Initially, that low amount was like 100,000 euros, so not that low. Now we're in the process of lowering that to 50K and then 10K. But um, a lot of people have been waiting for this, so it filled up much faster than we expected. And you mentioned that the retail investment market is quite regulated. Uh, how do those regulations affect what you're trying to do? And, and how do you get around, for example, the, uh, the cap on uh, non-qualified purchaser accredited investors put in place by the SEC? So um, different things for U.S. and Europe. In Europe, and then specifically in the Netherlands where we're headquartered, uh, there is a full license. We are 95% done obtaining that license, so we'll probably have it by May. And uh, before you have the full license, there are two exemptions. Either you have to invest at least 100,000 euros, or you can only have 150, you can only market towards 150 investors. We used both exemptions in our initial pilots last year. So the first exemption that we used, you just need to invest 100K at least. And that also ra- helped, helped us raise quite a lot of volume. So now we're at close to 100 million in assets under management, primarily with these 100K plus tickets. The other exemption we also trialed, and that was like the Climate Investment Club. And uh, people, so 
uh, we acquired up to 150 members of the Climate Investment Club. So people had sort of applied for the club. And if they were seriously interested in investing and fit the profile, they would become a club member and have the possibility to invest from 10K. So we trialed both of these. Next year, or next year, in, in next month, or in the coming two months, when we have the full license, we're actually allowed in uh, the Netherlands to market towards non-qualified investors, and we'll have a European passport to market towards qualified investors. So in the U.S., only qualified investors at this point can invest through carbon equity, right? So that's a constraint. Qualified meaning not just accredited, but actually qualified purchasers over, over $5 million in assets? No, uh, so accredited investors. Accredited, so accredited investors. Sorry, yes, correct. So, so in the U.S., you still need to be an accredited investor. In Europe, we will be launching what we call LTIF products, and that's the European Long Term Investment Fund, and that opens up the possibility to passports, retail investment type products. So, like the 10K uh, investment product, which we'll be launching in the Netherlands uh, from May onwards, will also be accessible in other European countries, not yet in the US. So in the US, we'll, we'll still have to figure out what the way is to truly get towards the retail investor. And so in the short term, it will only be accredited investors. Yeah, and selfishly, I mean, one of the reasons I asked that question is that we... Yeah, we're kind of a weird venture firm in that we're, you know, we're uh, raising this venture fund, but we have this vibrant member community and a lot of them, uh, well, one, there's a cap on the, you know, non-qualified purchasers. So if you're accredited with over a million in assets, but you don't have 5 million in assets, we're only allowed 99 of them. But then also, if you're not accredited, there's a lot of people in our community that, you know, that don't have a million in assets but want to put in a, like 1K because they identify, like what you were saying, they want to identify with, with you know, they want to get closer to the action. They, they, it's part, part of their identity, part of their, you know, they want to be part of the tribe. Um, and we just can't work with them. And it kills us because we're inclusive by nature. It's very frustrating. Exactly. So that nut we have cracked in Europe, not yet in the US. And, and you're right. Like actually most of the funds, because you asked me previously, how did he get into those funds? Most funds actually want these people on their cap table. So people actually really like the idea of democratizing ownership and being able to include the broader community of people who don't necessarily have millions of euros on their bank accounts. So, I mean, a lot of funds that we work with share that mission of wanting to include the broader community. Now, when you, and I guess as, I guess everything we need to distinguish, are we talking about Europe or are we talking about the U.S., right? Because they're, they're so, so different. Um, but when these retail investors invest, do, does each take, well, I guess this is a U.S. question. Uh, the, so another thing is we looked at passing a hat around or, or like a vehicle to pool the, the smaller checks, right? But even if you do that, the number of slots flows through to the people that fill that vehicle. That's at least what our, what our uh, council told us. Yeah, did, did you find that as well? So you're saying that you would have like a... Like if there's a vehicle, like, like one slot on the cap table, right? Actually, if there's 20 people that fill it, it's 20 slots on the cap table, which then goes towards that 99 cap, right? Exactly. So not for have... me, not for me and my vehicle, but for the actual fund that takes the money from that vehicle, yeah. Correct. So we experienced exactly that in the U.S. So the way around for us in Europe is we set up so we have single funds and we have fund of funds. And the fund of funds that we raised last year was like 45 million. This year we'll probably do like 75 million. And uh, if the vehicle that's investing in the U.S. fund is in excess of 25 million, you don't have that problem. So we're only able to invest in U.S. funds through our fund of funds type vehicle to avoid the fact that all of the investors, which are hundreds of investors who are invest investing in carbon equity, are counted towards that 100 person cap. So that's how we avoid it uh, through the European uh, side at the moment. So you're saying we could potentially like open up to broader members not accredited and as long as we can pool 25 million in capital then we could potentially be our own LP like through the community I think so so for example carbon equity 
hopefully will be investing in my climate journey. And then people could invest in my climate journey through that pooled vehicle, which then will not just be a single fund into my climate journey, but like a fund of funds. So you'll be investing in seven to 10 different VC growth equity and climate buyout funds. Huh, very cool. We talked about, and I, you know, I pulled you on this tangent, my, my apologies, but, but I wanted to understand that first three and a half million. And, Cause it's kind of like, um, like, yes, you're a capital allocator, but you're also a founder. Um, and, and so that those early founder stories are, are fascinating and also helpful to, for, for people to hear. Um, but okay. So, so where from there? So you did the three, actually I, I back up. So the three and a half million, what about the diligence? Like what kind of work did you do on 2150 and, uh, and, um, how did you equip yourselves to be able to do that work in a way where you felt like a responsible fiduciary and you could convey that to your potential investors? Super good question. So what makes carbon equity kind of unique is our climate diligence. And we spend a lot of time thinking on how do we evaluate what is a good climate fund and what makes one climate fund, you know, better from a climate impact perspective, not just a financial perspective. And so our climate framework, uh, first and foremost, really tests intentionality. Like how intentional is the fund, the partner team, to actually have climate impact? And how then does the team, the process, the incentives, the governance, and the execution, you know, line up with that intentionality? So what is the intention and how is the fund executing upon this intention? So we developed like a 40 to 50 question type scorecard where we score funds on every element of their impact structure. So let's say we'll have a look at how funds are, um, what targets they're setting for impact. What are the impact thresholds a portfolio company needs to meet to be invested in? Who is responsible for impact? What decisions are taken on impact at the level of the investment committee? Is a fund tying their incentives to actually add to realizing the impact or not? Is the carry dependent on realizing your impact objectives. And we'll also look at the whole portfolio of companies that you've already invested in or what your pipeline is and to understand what the impact rationale was and whether that's good enough or whether that's opportunistic. So we need to be fully convinced and we'll score every element and ultimately you get a score on a scale of one to five. Five means it's a global best practice and three means it's good enough for us. Like it's a, it's a good enough standard. So funds need to score at least a three on a five point scale for us to continue in the process. Only after we're convinced on climate diligence side, we'll move to the financial diligence and say, well, is this also a sensible investment? Is this a fund that we can, that, that is you know, likely to make a decent return? Uh, are there no red flags there? But the first step is really that climate diligence. So that's what we trialed with uh, 2150. And yeah, are continuing to refine that, that impact diligence process. So as it relates to a typical venture fund, uh, although I'm raising one now, I'm still learning how to be a VC because of course I've been you know, an entrepreneur and operator my, my whole career, not a, not a capital allocator other than as an angel, which is, which is very different. Um, but one of the things I learned is that, you know, if we want to, you know, benchmark ourselves against top tier returns, then it's like at, at minimum, uh, we, uh, you know, we should be looking at three X net of fees and, and hopefully much better if we, um, perform. What is that similar? I, and I, I should know this, but on the, on the fund of fund side, what is that benchmark from a strictly financial standpoint? And then how do you set expectations with your investors? And how do you think about internally your own financial return profile relative to that benchmark? So if a fund is making 3x and above, a fund of funds, depending a little bit on the cost structure, would be making two to two and a half x, right? So the key rationale to be investing in a fund of fund structure is risk mitigation. So and this, the, if you look statistically at this, the risk of a single fund making less than 1x your money back, meaning you make a, lot, a capital loss, is 24%. But if you invest in seven funds, that statistical risk is 1.5%. So, 
So much lower risk of capital loss. The flip side is that you're going to also have less outperformance because probably in your portfolio of seven funds, you might have one fund that does like a four or five X return, but you will have plenty of funds that are doing like two, three X return. So that means that that evens out and you're going to have less underperformance. You're going to have less overperformance. We communicate a target return of 10 to 15 percent per annum over a period of 12 years. That would be a two to two and a half X times your money back, which is very market standard for a fund of fund structure. And that's net of all fees, of course. So, and again, that's gonna be a relatively narrow margin. So, I mean, worst case would be maybe seven, eight percent, best case probably be 18, 20%, but as so, the, the margin for error, the spread of performance is going to be much less than with a single fund. And when you choose funds to back, how do you think about um, portfolio construction as it relates to, uh, like, are you the diversification provider or do you look for funds that have more diver- diversified approaches or, or, or both? We see ourselves really as a diversification provider. So if you look at the design of our most recent portfolio fund, it is 50% US, 50% Europe. Well, with the SVB stumble a few weeks back, you saw how incredibly important that geographic diversification is because all of our US funds had exposure, all of the European funds had very limited, if any, exposure. So geographic diversification is super important. Then we also do stage diversification. So in your portfolio fund, we'd probably do 40%, like 10% super early stage, 40% series A, series B, and then another 30% growth and a 20% buyout, for example. So really uh, diversifying between early stage type risks, which are technology risks, which may be market risk, and late stage where you have a different type of risk, which is more like operational risk, for example. And then the third dimension of diversification is thematic. So we cover the six big themes, agri-food, mobility, built environment, industry, energy, and carbon capture and storage. Some funds are fully thematic. So let's take an Astanor or a 2150. Astanor is like a really cool agro-food fund. 2150 is an urban tech uh, sustainability fund. And then we also invest in more generalist funds who are investing across all of those different, uh, all of those different themes. When you look at the composition of the investment teams at the firms that or funds that you're backing, uh, climate change touches every sector, and um, you can be in a sector but not necessarily climate motivated. Um, and, and so, so and a good example is like food and ag, or industrials, or energy, or you transportation, like. Pick a sector, right? Like you can be a trucking expert and not give a crap about, uh, you know, about about decarbonization, right? Um, and and but at the same time, you can be super climate motivated and not know the first thing about how to build a successful logistics company, right? Um, yeah. So so how do you think about sector expertise versus mission alignment? If if those are and I say versus as if they're in conflict, but uh, yeah, maybe versus isn't the right word. I'll have to think about that. I'm gonna say for us. Climate alignment is an important starting point. So because if funds are not intentional about climate, they might be great sector experts and they're probably going to do a couple of super impactful type investments, but might also do, you know, investments that have no, you know, no bearing on climate goals uh, at all. And our promise is you know, carbon equity is truly the best way to align your capital with your climate goals. So, I mean, we don't want to, we're not concessionary in that sense. Like we, we, we make no compromises. I do strongly believe in sector focus and more so in climate because like versus SaaS investing or marketplace investing, typically climate and especially deep tech type funds just require a lot more sector expertise. So I see a couple of advantages of sector funds one, they know their shit. They have experts who really come, at, for example, from the agro food sector or from, from the built environment or mobility sector. So I really like that deep technical expertise. Secondly, they often have a very relevant network within the industry. 
that can, uh, for example, with corporates who might also be investors in their funds. So they have a relevant commercial network. And the third is they build a reputation as being a specialist in agro-food as a result of which they also have a level of gravity of company or had companies knowing that fund and wanting to work with them exactly because they have that expertise. So, I mean, there are definitely pros and cons to generalist and thematic funds, but generally in the climate realm, I, I'm personally quite a fan of thematic funds. Going back to the first three and a half million uh, in investment that you made, uh, you, you mentioned that that it was a minimum of, I think it was 100K e euros. Uh, were there themes as it related to the 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 re the profile of who those initial LPs were, and also the reasons why they chose to um, to to make these investments? Definitely, a big part of our customer base are successful entrepreneurs who made a lot of money and now really want to. Yeah, align probably what they do in daily life, but also their money with climate goals. So for us, our most passionate customers are really quite climate impact motivated. We also have quite a lot of customers who are more opportunistic about it. And they're like, okay, I want to do a good investment. Climate is one of the biggest macroeconomic themes there's ever going to be. So I think this is going to be a high return type investment. But our most passionate customers are really people who want to solve climate problems with their money. So on the one hand, it's young entrepreneurs or, you know, who had who, who cashed out. We have an early one of the early employees of Airbnb, for example, who participated in a really early stage. We've got quite some next gens from family offices. We've got parents with children, children with parents, which is a really cool sort of intergenerational dynamic. And then there's also just a lot of people who are in corporate or professional services careers, let's say banking or, you know, who work at law firms, for example, and who maybe don't get to interact with the climate theme, but they care deeply about it. And also those people are, you know, some of our early adopters on, on the carbon equity platform. Have you looked at uh, donor advised funds as a source of capital for your LPs? Yes, we have. Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, we're starting to work with foundations as well, for example, who are looking to invest in line with their uh, climate impact mission. So increasingly, we're starting to see more professional investors investing through carbon equity as well. Uh, so also family offices, for example, who basically themselves don't really have expertise in, 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 in the climate realm. And so they're looking for a specialist who has that type of expertise. So definitely. Great. And so, so you did that first three and a half million investment and then how did things evolve from there and what were some of the key milestones uh, between then and, and now? And, and when was then, by the way, just to kind of frame how much time we're, we're talking about? We started Jan 2021. I think the team wasn't even full-time. It took us half a year to sort of like have everybody full-time on board. So we officially sort of started uh, July 2021 and launched our first fund in August. It was over the summer. Yeah, so milestones have been getting within an inch reach of 100 million. So we grew, so we acquired approximately 100 million in asset center management in the last uh, 15 months or so. So that was pretty fast. Another big milestone for us was launching the Climate Investment Club, which opened up access from $10,000 more or less, because that is, I mean, we're very excited about, you know, family offices and, and high net worth individuals investing through carbon equity. And, and I think we have a super relevant, you know, proposition for them. But the democratization, you know, mission is, is really close to our hearts. So actually having the possibility to work with, you know, a lot of smaller investors who are super, super passionate about it. We could make only 150 offers. So we could only send our deck to 150 people. That was the legal uh, requirement. And 140 out of those 150 accepted the offer to invest. So that was like a huge conversion rate and really showing how much passion and enthusiasm there is in that segment uh, for what we do. Internationalization was a big milestone. So we took baby, I mean, our first baby steps, we're now uh, hiring a team in Sweden and we're hiring a team in Berlin. So for any 
German or Swedish people looking to get into climate investing, uh, give me give me a call. So that is a, that's a big milestone. And the biggest milestone will be uh, next month when we hopefully get the full AFM license with a European passport, because that's going to allow us to expand internationally really fast. The 2150 investment, was that from a dedicated vehicle? And how how many dedicated vehicles do you have today? And and what uh, and, and maybe talk a bit about what each one's role is. So we uh, do, you should see carbon equity as a curated marketplace. And you can invest in single funds or in portfolio funds or fund of funds. And so the rationale for investing in a portfolio fund is diversification, having much broader exposure. And the rationale for a single fund is hey, I love this fund manager, or I want to have very specific exposure to, let's say, agro-food or growth equity or the built environment. So we did four uh, single funds, you know, special purpose vehicles, if you will. We did a growth fund, which is Lightrock, which comes from LGT uh, Capital, one of the best growth funds we've seen. We did Astanur, we did Arcturn, and we did... Um, uh, and we did 2150 and we'll be doing a couple more in the coming year. And then the fund of funds invested in seven to 10 funds, I think of which seven we have selected right now, which includes Energy Impact Partners Frontier Fund. I love that fund managed by Shail Khan, et cetera. They're doing Shale's such great. Cool. Yeah. No, Shale, Shale's one of the first people I met uh, on my on my climate journey, actually. So cool. I mean, the guy is so knowledgeable and so passionate and they're doing such awesome deep tech type investments in like form energy, which is like grid scale batteries, etc. I'm super excited about them. Azola Ventures is also a really cool one. It's a sister vehicle of Prime Coalition and they really oh, yeah. invest. We're, we're huge fans of them, too. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's so groundbreaking what they're doing and they really invest in stuff that otherwise wouldn't get investment. So this is really on the outer end of you know, almost catalytic capital, but really high impact uh, type investments. The agro food funds that I spoke about, um, ARA Partners, which is a really cool industrial bio fund. And what they do is they take first plant risk. So also super relevant uh, solution in the whole ecosystem. So, I mean, there's so many cool funds that we've been investing in and so many more fund managers that we're hoping to invest in. Uh, so, yeah, it's exciting. Great. And so you started with the... SPVs, will you continue to do these SPVs going forwards? Yes. So we'll have sort of three strategies. One is the single SPVs. And then we've got the overarching like fund of funds, which invests in all the funds that we uh, that we that we look at. And then probably we'll be launching more thematic fund of funds. So let's say a growth equity fund of funds or an agro food of fun fund of funds or a water fund of funds. So We'll have more of these thematic funds and the idea is long term that you can, you know, just go to carbon equity and say, hey, I'm interested in investing in, uh, in, in biodiversity or in circularity or in deep tech. And that's based on that, you can invest either in single funds or these small thematic fund of funds. Great. And when you think about your your uh, capital. I know you talked about democratization. Do you envision that the this entire capital base will be uh, these smaller in the grand scheme of things, but still very big uh, checks? I, I don't want to take away from the fact that it's still a lot of money. All right. Um, but but but, you know, relative to, say, a, a traditional endowment or pension fund or foundation. It, I mean, these are these are much smaller dollars do where, where, where do they you know the more traditional lps fit into all of this with your strategy if at all yeah so we realized that we actually have a super relevant solution also for professional lps because we're one of the world's most specialized players in climate fund selection uh, and also for a lot of these family offices or professional lps even pension funds that are looking to invest in climate it's a new domain. It's much less mature than traditional private equity investing. So diversification makes a lot of sense. So we set up a professional solutions unit uh, since early this year. And the professional solutions works with endowments, works with family offices, works with professional, uh, even pension funds 
to enable diverse fight exposure to climate venture capital and private equity. So what we help them with is selection of the funds and we set up specific vehicles for them to invest in the funds that we're already investing in. So and that makes a lot of sense. So we have two, we have retail solutions focused on uh, private investors and we've got um, professional solutions focused on yeah, professional investors investing a million euros or above. How do you think about your own team makeup? And and also, how do you think about the balance of, I'll oversimplify and say insider versus outsider. So, you know, kind of the entrepreneur upstart coming in with beginner mind, you know, looking at the category without all the bad habits and, and you know, preconceived ways of of doing things versus like, you know, just the understanding of how to do things by by the book in the traditional sense? When we started building our team, so, so I mean, Carbon Equity does, in effect, I would say we have three core competences. Like one is asset management. We actually select the funds. The second is we're building our own tech platform, which is an end-to-end -end digital investment platform. So we also have an own app where you can actually, you know, log in, tune in, you can see what companies you're invested in, you have a news feed and what's happening in your company. So the ability to bring to life what you're investing in through carbon equity is super important. That's a core competence on our end. And the third one is distribution. So, you know, being able to attract customers to our platform, but also plugging into private banks, plugging into pension funds, for example, as a result of which people can invest in carbon equity funds through third-party platforms. So those are our capabilities. The basis of all of this is really good fund selection, because if you don't have a really good product, the rest doesn't really matter. So we started off with you know, bringing into our team some real experience in fund of funds investing. So we hired uh, a really senior person from Alp Invest, which is the indirect arm of the Carlyle Group. Interestingly, he he is he's more of the traditional and also economical, <laughs> more sort of like more really a traditional finance guy, you know. So, but he's an absolute expert and he really put, brought along the entire playbook of how an Alp Invest looks at funds and how you diligence a fund all the way through and make sure that you know every aspect of, you know, risk in investing in such a fund. So I think such a discipline is super important. And then we combine that with our head of impact, who has a whole career in energy transition. She came from McKinsey, and she's really an expert in climate diligence. So that combination of people with yeah, experience from more traditional industries, but also really bringing the rigor and the professionalism of how things work elsewhere are the basis for a super professional team that does this climate diligence and, and general diligence. When I'm looking about like, you know, then expanding the team and growing the team, the thing I value most above experience is really hustle and like, and hunger. And like, so one of the most, and really one of the MVP players in my team is my associate. And he had no experience whatsoever, but he is so hungry to learn. He reads every book there is on climate, but also on how to build a business. And, you know, that, so I, in general, I strongly believe in hiring for attitude over CV. But when you're setting up your company, you really want to start at a super high level by hiring the best people in the industry to bring in that base level experience. And then you grow that with that people who are just yeah, awesome company builders. Great. And uh, we're about 45 minutes in and, and, uh, and I feel like we've been talking about this amazing ride and how much you've accomplished in such a short period of time. Uh, what hasn't gone right? Uh, what, what have been some disappointments along the way? What's been harder than you, than you thought it would be? Um, what are some barriers that you've been banging your head against the wall with as you've, as you've gone? We haven't hit a wall yet. I'm still expecting to hit one. <laughs> I think a few things. One, I would say currently we're sort of in the crossing the chasm phase. So like initially investing is a high trust type product, right? So, I mean, especially investing 100K or above is a really high trust product. And also, even if, you know, if you're investing 10K and you have 50K in total or 30K in total, then, you know, this is a high stakes decision. 
So you better trust, and it's long-term capital, right? Your money is going to be locked up for a while. So you really want to know that you're trusting people. So initially, a lot of the growth and traction came from within our network or extended network and people talking about us. And at some point, you've exhausted your network and you need to cross the chasm. And so now we get a lot more people who have learned about us on LinkedIn, on media, etc. And So they're excited, but then like, how do they trust you, right? So how do we scale trust? I think that's one of the big questions I'm facing now. How do we cross that chasm and also reach the, yeah, the more mainstream investor? And a question I'm struggling with, or not not necessarily struggling with, but like asking myself is like, how do you reach people outside of the bubble? So, I mean, it's super cool that a lot of people are already interested in climate you know, end up, find us uh, and, and people all the way from Brazil to Singapore actually found carbon equity one way or another because they absolutely wanted our product. But like, how do we get to people who don't necessarily care so much about climate and how do we get them excited about climate through carbon equity? That's, that's one of the things I, I really want to know. And so that's the main thing I'm, I'm thinking about and struggling because ultimately You know, my ambition with carbon equity is to get to a billion in the next five years and 10 billion in the next 10 years. And that's not just because I want to build a successful company, but because it needs to move the needle. You know, if we're doing this on too small a scale, it's it's not moving the needle. So and for that, you're going to have to tap outside of the climate bubble. It's amazing how how parallel our our journeys are. I mean, you know, of course, we'd we'd love to end up working with you uh, formally if it ends up making sense to do so. But that aside, uh, we should just definitely keep in touch because I mean, for us, like, as you know, we, you know, we've had all these um, individual backers for the last uh, few years. And and that was really just a subset, the subset of our community that could afford it, which, which stinks because we would like it to be everyone that wants to, right. Um, versus just people that are like of a certain asset um, threshold. And, and we just did a first big close on, uh, uh, and I guess this will be dated by the time it ships, but um, you know, on a, on our first larger, more traditional fund. And, and it was a big number. It was like over 50 million uh, U S but all, almost all from, the people that know us the best, right? The people like our, because our community is our, our network. Like they're 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 synonymous, right? Because um, we've been doing this five years, so it's like that's a that's a long runtime to you know to um, to get to know somebody and and build that that trust. And so on the one hand, it's like okay, the people that know us the best have this ringing endorsement of support, like that's awesome. But now we've got to leave the nest, and it's like, what do you mean flywheel, like? Uh, how powerful is it? Like it's a fucking podcast, right? Um, yeah. So it, it's uh, so it's like no, no, really. Like we're you know. But uh, anyways, and then and then it's the debate of like you know, do you just extend one level out, or do you try to go top down to like the big institutional, more more traditional allocators and really anchor? And um, anyways, we we don't have answers yet. We're still pretty early in the process, but it's um, uh, it's fascinating just to hear about your journey because as I said, there's a lot of um uh, similarities. Jason, can I ask you, like, what have been the key challenges on your journey in, you know, raising capital to fund climate solutions? Yeah, well, um, well, everything's been really organic to date where it's it's like we, you know, started just by learning and then it became a public journey. And then, you know, as it was a public journey, there started being a following and then that following, like, was longing for a peer group. And so we set up the community and then I started writing little angel checks as another way to learn. And then, you know, more and more people from the community were like, I want to play behind your hand. Like those are awesome companies. And then we needed a dedicated pool of capital. And then, you know, Angelus made it easy to get going. And we've been investing from that for nine quarters. And then it's like, all right, you know, that was a great MVP, but like, can we stop getting out of the, you know, like with Angelus, it's like every, you know, it's like a three month appointment period. So it's like, you're constantly thinking about the next fund. It's like, all right, it's been nine quarters. Like we have a fucking strategy now. Like we're ready to actually settle in and just implement it for a while, you know, versus constantly, you know, treading the treadmill. Yeah. And you're like, we want to set, like we're ready. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the logic of the traditional fund is like, we don't want to lose the inclusivity of, um, you know, of, of all the, you know, all those strategic, well-placed, mission-aligned individuals that, you know, that that put us in business. But we need, you know, some deeper pockets that think in terms of many funds uh, instead of instead of one fund at a time. So that as a firm, we can really like plant some roots and 
and and grow. And 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 then from a timing standpoint, we set out to do that. You know, like like a year ago would have been much better from a macro standpoint. Although you could argue climate has you know, but but from a traditional tech and venture, right? Um, climate, you know, climate has t tailwinds, and so do those balance out, or where does that net out? Like it, that's a longer, you know, that's a more nuanced discussion, I should say. Um, but. Uh, um, we, you know, we, we, we set out, uh, at a time, it would have been easier a year ago, but at the same time, we weren't ready a year ago. And so we're setting out when we're ready, right? Cause we're not going to, we can't control market timing. Uh, and then it's like, all right, well, we want to be measured by returns, but do we really want truly unemotional, just purely mercenary LPs? Like that doesn't feel great with who we are. Right. Um, it, but yet we need the deeper pockets. And then if, if, if they're too deep, then they probably have, you know, even if they're emotional, they probably have someone who's making those decisions on their behalf who's unemotional, right? And so what's the right profile? So those are all the twists and turns we're trying to figure out is similar to hiring. It's like, what do you screen for? And at the same time, like beggars can't be choosers because this is a fun one, right? So... Yeah, I'm hoping we can solve many of these problems for you, like be, you know, a long term, stable, totally mission aligned LP, ultimately in my climate journey. That would be really cool. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. But regardless of whether that works out, it's just so cool what you're doing. And you've done a lot in a short period of time and you have a big vision and you're, you know, from everything you've said, you're, you know, you're coming at it from the right place and being really intentional with the decisions that you're making, both from in terms of building a healthy financial business, but also you know, having the impact that you set out. I guess my two final questions, uh, one is just, who do you want to hear from in the community and how can we either as, you know, MCJ, the team or MCJ, the broader ecosystem, uh, be helpful for you? Who? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> well, if I can ask you anything, I would love to get into Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Like we... We think that is, you know, we looked at a couple of funds that we really deem absolutely best in class when it comes to climate impacts. I mean, Just Climate, which is a vehicle of Al Gore, uh, Prime Impact Coalition, where we're in the as well as sister vehicle, and then Breakthrough Energy Ventures, they're a league of their own uh, when it comes to really doing the big, bold bets that I'm a big fan of. So... If you have an intro at Bill Gates, uh, that would be good. <laughs> but, I love uh, it. Dude. I, dude, I, I, this might be the first time someone's like shooting their shot on uh, I, I, on the My Climate Journey podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're Dutch, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Does it get more direct than the Dutch? So, um, yeah, I'll be waiting for that intro. <laughs> and what about the broader community? So for anyone listening and, uh, you know, we're we're a humble little show, but 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 in, in our own, you know, in the little climate world, kind of a lot of people listen. So what what message do you want to leave them with? Oh, wow. So this is such a cool opportunity to tap your network. Um, so first of all, we're looking for people to join our team, especially in uh, London, in Berlin and in Stockholm, where we're setting up international operations. Super interested to meet you. I mean, obviously, so soon uh, from May, we'll have 50K access from the Netherlands and Belgium, and we'll be launching European access. So that would be a, a big thing. People who want to take carbon equity to their respective geography, we've got people from Singapore, we've got people from Mexico who are like, oh, how do I get carbon equity to uh, my respective geography? And we're very open to having these types of conversations with entrepreneurs who are looking to yeah, bring the concept uh, elsewhere. So anybody who is excited about building you know, greater access to climate solutions through our climate fund investing platform, love to talk to you. And... Also happy to return the favor. So, you know, if I can help you build your business, uh, offer advice on how to raise funding, you know, feel free to reach out, link with me on LinkedIn. I get a ton of messages, so I'm really sorry if I don't respond fast enough, but ask me again. So be a little bit persevering and yeah, I'd love to, to help the community uh, as well. 
And Jacqueline, do I get to put a bug in your ear about how you can be helpful to us? Yes, yes, yes. Jason, tell me I how. I never asked that before, but it's my show, <laughs> damn it. Yes. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> uh, so one, one is just mission aligned family office and, and multifamily office is a real sweet spot uh, in terms of LPs for our fund. We expect to be measured by financial returns and strictly financial returns at the same time, both because we like working with these people better and because we think our story resonates better, emotional capital. So like people that want to make money, but like, you know, also, you know, but if they were only looking at making money, there's, there's like easier ways to make short term dollars. In the long term, we think this is a huge wealth creation opportunity, right? But in the short term, we want people that give a shit, right? Um, so that's one. And the second is just, um, you know, this is a new series, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the climate capital, and we're trying to unpack, you know, what's happening up and down the climate capital stack. So that means, you know, GPs of early stage funds, GPs of growth stage funds. It means project finance. It means, you know, government agencies deploying capital. It means, um, you know, fund of funds, endowments and, and pension, family office, maybe even individual investors, but just we're trying to just kind of shine a light on what's happening out there, how people think, what their journey is, what they're wrestling with, what criteria they're using to deploy, et cetera, so that we can foster more connectivity. So to the extent either there's funds that you've backed or other LPs in your network that you think um, would be excited about more transparency in their approach on the platform that we have to tell their story, then let me know. I will. I can help you with both. So happy to make introductions on both ends. Definitely. Great. Uh, Jacqueline, anything I didn't ask that I should have or any parting words for listeners beyond what you already said, which was kind of a mic drop in itself. So maybe maybe that's it. Yikes. Well, well, for me, reading like reading the IPCC report this week, you know, we we are in a hurry. So, I mean, parting last words, let's do everything we can, both with capital and our talent and our voice. Let's mobilize as much resources to, you know, stopping climate change in its tracks because it's the most important thing we can do right now. And thanks for this opportunity, Jason. Well, great point to end on. LFG, let's get out there and fight the good fight. And, um, yes. uh, you know, we hadn't we hadn't spoken before. I've spoken with some of your team, but we hadn't had the chance to speak before this show. And now, look, we're, uh, you know, we're ending uh, with a better understanding of each other's firms and also as friends. So um, I'm super looking excited. forward to much collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Same goal, uh, joint mission. Let's work together much more on this. Would love to. OK, thank you cool. for coming on the show, Jacqueline. Best of luck to you and the whole Carbon Equity team. Yes, thank you. <laughs>